Thank you very much. I agree with everything you say there. Um, I'd like to pay tribute too, actually, to the Centre and the work it does here. When I first came across, um, came aware of the work that uh, is done here at Cardiff um, while I was researching my book um, three years ago now. And um, uh, very important work being done on the imamate, the prison chaplaincy, um, which was kicking against the trends at the moment with the tabloids were accusing the chaplains of, um, of effectively radicalizing people in prison. Um, and here was some proper ac academic work being done showing that actually that wasn't the case and that in many cases they were doing a really very important job in extremely difficult circumstances. And it's a good example of, of the kind of work, the kind of better understanding that we need um, when we're considering um, the Muslim community in the country. Anyway, so listen, um, the, this talk has got a question mark on it. You know, Islam, another British religion. And I, I kind of want to start really with a, a sort of a spoiler, really, and just answer the question. Um, and the answer is yes, of course, um, you know, Islam is another British religion. Um, it's, um, that became abundantly clear to me while I was doing my book, um, this one here. It was uh, a year of traveling around all the Muslim communities I could get to in a year, which I had a bit longer than that, actually, 18 months to, to research the book. Um, and uh, for me personally, it was a sort of a, a tremendous eye-opener. And I've lived here all my life, obviously. I thought I knew my country quite well. By the time I'd finished it, I had a completely different conception of Britain, what it means to be British. My own Britishness was kind of altered by these travels around the country and, um, and actually particularly by what I did at the end of it, which was during Ramadan 2016, I thought I would try and get close to the religion and I, I did the fast, I did the whole month um, at a time when it fell right over the height of the summer. So it was a particularly long fast. It was a, um, uh, I lost a lot of weight, that's for sure. Um, but um, so anyway, it is for sure, um, you know, another British religion now. It didn't used to be. Uh, and I, you can divide these things into two kind of sort of areas, you know, societally. I mean, just look at the numbers of Muslims we now have in the country. And I'm sure a lot of people know this already, but three million people identify now, I think, ident self-identifying as Muslims. That's 5% of the country. With spikes in London, is 12%. Um, and there are many cities and towns in the country that are, you know, up, up to sort of 20%, that kind of area. So these are kind of very large numbers and they have doubled since the turn of the century. Um, and so just on the numbers alone to go on um, with this now completely antiquated idea that Muslims, that Islam is somehow other to our society isn't sustainable anymore because of the numbers. You can't, you cannot kind of go on pretending that 5% of the people that make up all the country, uh, all the people that live in the country are somehow not a part of us because clearly our society has changed in its makeup. Um, and, you know, it follows from that that we've really got to, all of us, but non-Muslims I'm really talking about, have got to start thinking about Islam in a different way um, uh, and our country in a different way. And that is really the point of my book. And that's why I called it Our Britannia um, with this sort of slightly, you know, modestly kind of subversive version of the Union Jack on it, a kind of a you know, Ottoman eyes, if you like, um, pattern on it, and, you know, to try and get people to think slightly differently um, about our country. That's what it's all about. Um, and, you know, I mean, what I, you know, I, I was fascinated to see, I and mean, the question I was asking myself um, while researching it was whether, you know, a distinctively British form of Islam existed, whether it was, um, you know, beginning to emerge after the um, the, the, um, the influx of Muslims that came into the country in the, in the, you know, after the war in the 50s and 60s. And I, you know, I, I think the answer is that it is um, you know, a distinctively British form of Islam. Um, and I take my line on this really from my, my great friend in Bradford, Abdul Haq Bewley, who some of you may know, um, who is a, a, a white convert, um, converted years ago back in the 60s. He you was know, an old hippie really. Uh, he knew Eric Clapton, and he's part of that whole kind of rock and roll era, just when the Beatles were off um, doing their stuff in India with, with the, you know, the, the yogis. You know, he was in Morocco um, discovering himself in Islam and converted, and he came back and indeed set up um, you know, a Muslim community, the first white indigenous community in Britain, um, uh, in Bristol Gardens in Little Venice in the 1960s. And so he has a rather unique kind of um, oversight of 
you know, what has happened to the religion that he's been following now for um, half a century. Um, and you go and meet him, and you know, he's got this wonderful um, uh, thing going on in Bradford. It's a weir, I think it's called, um, sort of a centre there. Um, and it's all unbelievably British. And you go there, I, you know, when I heard about this place, I couldn't wait to go there for the first time. And it sounded incredibly exotic and, you know, you know a kind of Moroccan Zawiya opposite a tyre shop in West Bradford. I mean, this is kind of, whoa, you know. Um, and you get there and Abdul Haq is this kind of English gent serving cups of tea with digestive biscuits. You couldn't be more British, you know. And you suddenly realise that actually you know, there's no reason why Islam shouldn't be a British religion. Um, and as practised by him, it is. I mean, that's the way it is. It's the, um, he, he's, he's turned it into one. And, um, you know, and actually meeting him is very much... Um, it reminds me of the, you know, it reminded me then, as it still does, of this that famous um, notion that Islam is, I'm sure you all know it, is like a river, and uh, it takes on the colour and the character of the of the bed over which it flows, um, and and so it's not a culture, it's a it's a filter for a culture which takes on the um, the the attributes of its surroundings. So, which is why you know French Islam or Spanish Islam is all these are all quite distinct in, within Europe, even just in Europe, and and you know. So the question, is a British version of this beginning to emerge? And the answer is, yes, it is. Um, you know, Abdul Haq would say that, you know, he's been waiting for it to emerge all his life and it's taken rather longer um, to arrive than he'd hoped, but he does see signs of this distinctively British um, uh, uh, Islam arriving. And he, he cites as an example um, some of the architecture of the new mosques um, which are being built. And he mentioned one particularly in Wakefield, I think, um, which is not um, your usual kind of rather gaudy pastiche of um, Arabian architecture. It's actually a you know, completely unique kind of British built mosque. You know, this, is a, this is something quite new, um, but it's a sort of a, uh, a, an example of, um, of Britishness and uh, coming, coming into play. Um, you know, and as I found actually, you know, the, the, the notion of conversion, you know, converts, even that, for people that don't know much about Islam is a very um, exotic, um, you know, possibly rather suspect thing. I mean, most people, most non-Muslims, when they read about white converts, you know, it tends to be attached to tabloid stories about terrorists or people going off to ISIS or so on. But actually, conversion is not um, like that at all. Um, you know, the, there is a lot of conversion going on in the country. Um, and here's a fun fact, actually, is that before World War II in this country, when the, the Muslim population was about 10,000, um, only 10,000, isn't that amazing? Um, fully 1,000 of them, one-tenth of them, were white native converts. Now, we're talking about the people like Marmaduke Pickthall and all these old Lord Headley and all these kind of extraordinary people that were the, sort of the pioneers of a specifically British Islam. Very old-fashioned. They all coalesced around... Um, the Shah Jahan Mosque in Woking was the great place and built in the 18, 1880s. Um, but there you go. I mean, there's a, there, there, there is a, a, a history to British Islam, which was a discovery for me, for sure. Um, but all of that to one side, I mean, almost more interesting than the societal, cultural history of it all is that, you know, is, is the, the spiritual aspect of, of Islam in this country, which I think is, you know, where the British religion thing really is almost more interesting. Um, and, you know, what I became very clear to me, kind of travelling around the country, and especially during Ramadan, was that all of the religious energy in this country now, it seems to be focused on Islam. It's not Christianity, it's not uh, Hinduism or anything else. It seems to be um, where anything that's going on religiously is, is happening. And, um, you know, it, it's obvious when you go to you know, as I did, to many churches, um, inner city churches, which have lost their congregations and in many cases have been converted into mosques. I mean, that is the ultimate symbol of the shift in kind of religious um, um, kind of happening in the country, and it's all over the place. Um, and the statistics are pretty clear, you know. I mean, uh, re Islam is the fastest growing religion here. Christianity is in, in very sharp decline. Um, I think that the regular weekly church attendance now is uh, under a million in this country, um, three quarters of a million on Sundays. I mean, it's, it's tiny for a, a country that still you know, persists in calling itself, identifying itself as a Christian country, but actually they're not going to church. Um, and so there is something shifting a lot in, 
you know, faith and um, religiosity of spirituality. And I, I think that's incredibly interesting because I don't think that people have changed that much. Um, I mean, it's rather a personal reflection, perhaps, but the, the need for spirituality is a constant in, in human beings. And if people aren't getting it from the established Christian church, um, where are they getting it from? And, you know, perhaps that's a discussion for something else, but I, you know, I, I, I've got children who are being taught this thing, mindfulness in schools, which seems to me to be a kind of a substitute for, you know, 100 years ago, it would have been straightforward Christianity that they were being taught, and they're not getting that anymore. And, um, I don't want to go down that line too much, but it's, it, it's sort of rather fascinating. And um, I found, you know, actually, that particularly during Ramadan, um, when Muslims are at their best, they're the most generous, um, most open, and my goodness, they were. I, mean, I ate for free for a month, um, traveling around the country during Ramadan. I'm sure many of you had the similar, similar experiences, but it, it is remarkable um, how curious, how tolerant, how, you know, and all of these things, that these, these attributes, when I stopped to think of them, were remarkably similar to the famous fundamental British values that the Home Office keeps banging on about, has done for years and years. I mean, they, it's what they are, you know, and I kind of, how, more, how more British could it be? Um, you know, and it, you know, the, 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 the awful, the, the tragic Joe Cox story and, you know, the, the hashtag more in common campaign that was um, set up after a death. Well, it's true. I mean, that is a very good um, hashtag to hang on to because, you know, particularly during Ramadan, I, th I thought that there was, you know, the more in common thing was exactly spot on. And um, uh, so that's very encouraging, I think. And, um, you know, um, I... A quick word, actually, just about the, the um, you know, how people manage to find ways to that common ground between. I mean, it, you know, you, the, the, the tabloid debate tends to be about division, about, has been about ISIS for the last two years. It's beginning to slow down now, thank goodness. But over 20 years, you know, the whole narrative has been framed around extremism and, and, and terrorism and the rest of it. Um, and then we just had the Christchurch um, mosque attack, awful thing in New Zealand. But the language coming out after that I thought was pretty interesting. You know, Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister, kind of, you know, you could call it gesture politics if you like, but I, you know, I think it's great that, um, you know, the day of wearing, uh, you know, taking the veil, taking the hijab, and, you know, that actually very inspiring. Um, and I liked also that um, the old geezer here in Manchester, he's called Andrew Greystone, you see that, who um, spontaneously went to his mosque and, um, and had a placard saying, you are my friends, I will watch over you while you pray, you know, in the aftermath of the Christchurch thing. Well, that's wonderful. Um, and that is a, a, an instance of communities coming together and crossing over all the rhetoric and the fear and so on. Um, and that there are occasional examples. I mean, even Alex Salmon, weirdly, um, 10 years ago, um, just after the, more now, 12 years ago, after the... Uh, Glasgow airport bombing, you might remember. Well, his response to that was brilliant, I thought. One of the first things he did was to um, go to Glasgow airport and put up a big billboard, you know, where it usually says, you know, welcome to Scotland. And he got a photograph of a Scottish Asian in a kilt and stuck it up there, you know, huge poster and said, Scotland welcomes you. And I thought, oh, what a superb piece of public relations, what a brilliant way of saying, we'll have none of that division here, you know, we're with you you're with us, you're part of us. And that's kind of what we need to see more of. Um, anyway, um, that's perhaps the sort of the sunlit uplands that we'd like to be, um, where we'd like to get to. Um, we're obviously a long way from that because there are um, several obstacles and problems, um, as we all know. I'm going to talk about um, these now a little bit. And I've sort of divided them into kind of three areas. And I'm going to canter through them, but um, I mean, first jotted down on the back of my piece of paper here, you know, it, it's actually, you know, everything that goes wrong is based, it, 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 the root of it is always ignorance. Very simple. People just do not understand this, this, uh, this religion that um, if you're a native um, non-Muslim Brit, um, the level of kind of misunderstanding about what Islam is, about who Muslims are, what they what they believe and what they represent um, cannot be um, uh, cannot be overestimated. Um, obviously, that narrative has not been helped by 
you know, the narrative of the press narrative ever since 9-11, you know, it's nearly 20 years now, um, and it's egged on by um, dog whistle politics, to use the word, um, of the right wing, um, which is all linked to immigration and to Brexit and so on. Um, so, you know, there are constant rows um, over things like, you know, the niqab. Um, but actually, I, I, you know, the, the one that really got me while I was researching was, was the whole business of Sharia law. Um, because in 2016, this is when Nigel Farage was, you know, on the march, and he was talking about swathes of the country, if you remember, um, uh, kind of where the police didn't dare to go because they weren't subject to common law because Sharia law had replaced, you know, um, replaced it. And, um, well, you know, I had to get to the bottom of that, and that was part of my journalistic mission, was to go and look at these, these accusations and see if I could turn them over. Um, and it was not easy to get, into, to get up close to Sharia law in action, but I did manage it eventually. I, I persuaded a, 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 an Ulama council um, in Oldham, actually, in the end, to kind of let me sit, on, sit in on one of their, their sessions, um, you know, one of these courts, as they were being called in the tabloid in the, the papers. And what I found was that, um, you know, they weren't competing with common law, English law, at all. Um, but they were complementing it. It was a completely different thing, and they were absolutely adamant about where, you know, where their jurisdiction stops and where national law began. And actually, all that they were doing, all that they were doing in this council, was um, issuing divorces to um, women, almost entirely women, who were trapped in, um, you know, in, in uh, Muslim-only marriages, which the English courts don't recognise. So they couldn't get divorced in the national system because in, in, in English legal wise they weren't actually married I mean that was so the only way they could get out of these and, and the terrible marriages the amount of domestic violence that was going on um, awful I mean it was a terrible sort of um, kind of insight into um, you know look through the kind of bedroom keyhole of Muslim Britain actually it was kind of something it was, it was kind of it was, it was pretty grim but but you know I came away thinking that this court was actually performing a fundamental um, um, vital public service because if they weren't there these women were going to be trapped in these often very abusive marriages is their only way out of these things and you know that is a sort of narrative you almost never hear um i actually wrote that up for the spectator which I thought was quite brave of me <laughs> um and uh, uh complete madness actually and i even went in afterwards and did a a, a blog um about it afterwards and I, i've never had so much vitriolic um the way that things happen now, you, you write your article and you get below the line comments, it opens it up to the readership for a few days. I think I had 980 comments below the line, every single one of them was negative. Who is this person? He's been, you know, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Obviously these Sharia judges have kind of pulled the wool over his eyes, must be naive. It, amazing sort of prejudice that was going on. And, um, but, um, and it just showed to me how, how, how extraordinarily little people know about um, about Sharia, about anything really, and how easy it is for um, people like Nigel Farage or Tommy Robinson, whoever it might be, to kind of make the other case and how easily it gets believed. Um, anyway, ignorance breeds suspicion and, that's, and suspicion breeds fear, and that is you know, the job of education, um, journalism perhaps. I wish there were more people going into Sharia courts and describing what actually happens there. Um, Anyway, moving on, um, the second problem, this kind of was made to me, clear to me very well by, again, by Abdul Haq Buley, who, you know, he was a conservative, conservative practitioner of his faith. And, you know, he said that, that the problem is this, is that, is that you know, Western mores um, have changed enormously over the last 50 years on things like sexuality, on homosexuality, on sex education is another one, whereas, um, you know, Islamic ones, on the whole, have not. Um, and so there is this, uh, they're out of step, that's the thing. And on top of that, there is this sort of notion that Western mores are somehow immutable, even though actually they've, they've changed in 50 years. But this idea that they are the, you know, the apogee of civilization, of, of, of morality, um, of progress, and that everything else is inferior and has to catch up. And that seems to be the kind of the great sort of West trap. Um, and it, it seems to infect everything when, when actually, you know, 
Of course, that is not the only benchmark of progress in civilization. It couldn't be. And why should it be immutable? I mean, for heaven's sake, if it's only been around, you know, if, if um, you know, legalization of gay marriage, say, you know, when I was born, it was, you could still get locked up for it. And there's enormous change. But to suggest that it won't change again in the future, well, I don't know. People must know how to tell the future because I don't. I mean, I, it's a very, very strange thing, this idea that it, you know, this, this, is, this has to be, um, you know, the benchmark that everyone else has to catch up to. But it does remain this huge kind of flashpoint. And it's still going on now, as I'm sure you're all aware. You know, there's a row going on in Birmingham at the moment, um, particularly over um, LGBT awareness in, uh, in teaching in schools. Um, and, you know, I, I spent quite a lot of time um, looking at the Trojan horse um, schools story. I spent a lot of time in Birmingham talking to teachers and kids who've been caught up in it. And, um, and I, you know, it really amazed me. And I'm, I'm absolutely certain that the government was wrong, actually. I and mean, I, you know, I kind of found myself, I, I found it very difficult to kind of see both sides on that, which is my journalistic kind of instinct. But it just seemed to be quite, quite wrong um, because, um, you know, it's one thing to insist on, you know, a certain amount of, of um, uh, you know, liberal education ideas, but it's been replaced by a different dogma, which seems to be wrong. And it's, a, it's secularism. It's a kind of a rather shrill secularism that, um, you know, Michael Gove, um, in particular, wanted to um, replace it with. And I, I, I interviewed Michael Gove for this, um, went, went down to Parliament and had a strange sort of rather kind of sort of, sort of failures communicate kind of interview um, um, in a tea room in, in, in Parliament where he said absolutely categorically he said you know he said, said that there are posters up and they closed down four or five schools and replaced all the staff and renamed them and the kids came back with a different thing and in the new version of these schools in Birmingham you know there are posters up saying in the corridors saying you know it is okay to be Muslim and gay you know this kind of stuff and um, but, you know, for a conservative Muslim, it isn't. It's actually just a sort of straightforward kind of point of, of doctrine that, that it isn't. You know, to, to, that is kind of pushing a different dogma, um, trying to supplant something um, which I think is wrong, and, or certainly the wrong approach. Um, you know, another crazy thing that was going on in the new versions of those schools was that, you know, they, they got very hot under the collar about segregation uh, in classrooms. Um, remedy for this was to insist that boys and girls sit next to each other in the classrooms. You know, they had double desks, boy, girl, boy, girl, boy, girl, like that. And, you know, and the teachers there were explaining to me that you know, there was never any forced segregation in the school before. You know, this is completely in the minds of the Ofsted inspectors. You know, they were coming, but of course, you know, what happens is that you've got a mixed class, um, teenagers come in, they segregate themselves. And that happens in non-Muslim schools too. Boys go over there, girls over there, they all sit with their mates, you know. And actually, when you're 16, you know, and going through, you know, that super sensitive time of life, you know, kind of trying to fix up with girls and, you know, girlfriends and boyfriends and the rest of it. I mean, segregation is not necessarily an ideological or dogmatic thing at all. Um, but anyway, in came Ofsted and said, you know, thou shalt sit next to each other, which seems to me to be pretty clearly wrong, um, insensitive at best. Um, uh, but actually in Birmingham, they kind of resented it bitterly as a form of cultural bullying. And I sort of rather agreed with that, actually. Um, it's not just um, Muslims, by the way. I mean, I'm sure you know this, but you know, this is a, you know, this new secularism that's being pushed by Ofsted is affecting the Orthodox Jewish community hugely at the moment. There was something in the papers yesterday. Um, you see this about, a, um, I think, somewhere in North London saying that, uh, Orthodox Jewish guy saying that parents are now actively seeking out schools, um, f Jewish faith schools, which have failed um, Ofsted tests because they regard it as a badge of honor. Um, and, I, and I think that's extremely interesting because it shows you um, that there is a limit to what legislation can do and probably a, a limit to what legislation ought to do. Um, yeah, and maybe things like sex education or you know, teaching respect even towards homosexuals, for example, might be something that is better done at home in the family rather than at school by legislation. It's a very clumsy, blunt instrument. Um, uh, and I think that if you legislate on this stuff, you end up with, you can, and you usually do, end up with lots of unintended consequences, you know, like Orthodox Jewish parents seeking out schools that have 
failed Ofsted um, because it's a badge of honor. Uh, it reminds me rather of that, um, I'm old enough to remember when seat belts came in, mandatory seat belts in the, in the 1980s. Do you remember that? And, um, and the seat belt lobby was very, very powerful at the time. And it said, um, hooray, you know, they, they'd done some research and whatever it was, 3,000 people a year were going through the windscreen and car crashes. And they went, hooray, we're going to save the lives of 3,000 people every year. And then in came seat belts. And they did a follow-up study a year or two later. And they discovered that uh, the same number of people were dying in car crashes. And they couldn't work out why. And it turned out that because people were wearing seat belts, they felt safer. So they were driving, on average, five miles an hour faster, and therefore having more crashes. And you know, I mean, that was clearly not an intended consequence. And I think that there are limits to legislation. And it's a great mistake to go down this kind of you know, micromanaged thing, especially when it comes to such sensitive matters as faith and belief. And, you know, um, so, you know, I mean, I mean Western mores, I mean, I've, you know, of course, there have to be some red lines, you know. I mean, a row about sex education is kind of, you know, small beer when you, you know, compared to some other issues like um, honour killing, for example, honour killing or, you know, or, or um, domestic violence, you know, kind of, you know, the whole business of it's okay to beat your wife in certain circumstances, that kind of stuff. I, I think there do have to be some red lines. Um, but, you know, I... I, I'm also pretty convinced that actually, if you want to change these things, these things have to come from within. Um, if you try and legislate from on top, it's just bullying, it's going to be ineffective, it's not going to be sustainable. Um, and I'm optimistic, actually, because I think that change does come from within. You know, that was one of the things I observed, um, the differences in attitudes between generations of Muslims um, around the country. You know, there's a huge change from you know, the way that... You know, Mirpuri grandfather thinks to his grandson in kind of, you know, Alan Rock or something. I mean, there, there are, you know, everywhere he went, you kind of get these sort of rather, often rather charming kind of, oh, granddaddy would think like that kind of conversations. And, um, and the younger generations do become more British, more aligned, more open very often. But I think that you have to tread very, very slowly on these things and it's not something you can force from on top. And it sort of rather, you know, um, dismays me when I see right-wing politicians trying to do that. Um, you know, I think they need to have more faith in people because people will change themselves. Um, which sort of brings me on to the sort of third problem, um, which is this question of political leadership. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's kind of an old saw now, you know, this question, you know, is the Tory party Islamophobic? You know, it's kind of a great debate that kind of goes on and on and on. I have to say that I think that the, the evidence keeps on mounting. I, mean, I, it's, it's a, I think there is a serious problem. Um, uh, and, you know, I think that Saeed Awasi and, you know, Naz Shah, you know, people like that are fighting a very kind of lonely battle. Um, and I also think it's no wonder that there's so much pushback against prevent, uh, because there is this sense that there, uh, the, the playing field is not level, um, and there is this kind of um, prejudice against Muslims. Um, I was thinking a little bit about, you know, kind of just one example in the political arena, you know, the, 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 the London mayor, mayor, mayoralty, if that's the word, um, just looking about it in the past, you know, I mean, we used to have Boris, um, you know, who not so long ago was um, having a go at the niqab again, you know, calling it a letterbox, never apologised for it, um, was never reprimanded for that, just kind of sails on. Sails on. I, I thought, uh, actually, um, in relation to that, I thought there were some lovely uh, memes online about that. There was a wonderful photograph of someone in a niqab posing with a, next to a letterbox saying, here's my new bestie. You see that? See. You see that? I thought that was brilliant. I mean, brilliant. And, and it was sort of, and actually, you know, the humour of that. I mean, there was something about the letterbox as well. It was so British, you know. And it was the best possible response to this kind of, you know, superb, you know. Um, uh, Zach Goldsmith, we were talking about earlier, you know, I mean, you know, his election campaign was, was pretty inexcusable, I think. And he still, um, you know, he still thinks, he still sort of dismisses men um, as extremists. Well, I know, you know, Sahar is here, but I, you know, I, I, I met a lot of people from men when I was doing my book. And, you know, to dismiss them as extremists is, is ridiculous. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, you know, they, uh, anyway, I mean, we, we, we won't get into discussion about men now, but, it, you know, too often... Um, you see people like Zach Goldsmith who kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're recycling 
second-hand opinions and analysis which is wrong in the first place. And they do it, it seems, very lazily, too willingly. You know, they're not, they're not questioning their own sort of, you know, it fits in with their prejudices. And it's, 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 it's pretty depressing to sort of see it from Zach Coldsmith. And, um, and I've got a new candidate, for uh, Tory candidate for mayor, this guy, Sean Bailey, who's, again, you know, in the same mould, has said some terrible things in the past. You know, maybe he's changed his mind, but you know, ten years ago he was talking about, um, you know, if we accommodate—that was the word he used—if we accommodate all these Muslims and Hindus, you know, um, there's a danger of, I think he said, something turning turning Britain into a cesspool of crime. And that's pretty a pretty hard language from someone who wants to be mayor of London, which is 12% Muslim. Um, I mean, really, that's the language of Tommy Robinson. I mean, I don't see any different. I mean, it seems to me to be completely. Um, racist, really. It's an, on a par with Nigel Farage's talk about swathes of lawless Britain, and you know it's pretty troubling. Um, and then we had Andrea Leadsom just the other day. That was another good one, I thought. Um, who referred? This is a really interesting one. So Naz Shah was um, asking for an inquiry into Islamophobia in the Tory Party, and her, her, uh, Andrea Leadsom's response was to refer it to the Foreign Office. Um, <laughs> What an amazing, I mean, she gave herself away there because suddenly you can see, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's such a tribal response that, isn't it? And she clearly thinks, I don't think Andrea Ledson's very bright, I, I, I hope I can say that, but she goes that Islam, she's got this thing that Islam is still foreign. You know, that's the thing. It still belongs out there somewhere. It's not part of us. And, oh, foreign, uh, foreign office. <laughs> that's the thing. But it, it, was, it, it was a thoughtless, silly thing to say, but it, it gave away how... You know, her, her response to Islam appears to be kind of visceral. It's kind of almost unconscious. It's almost, you know, this perception that Islam is somehow the other. Um, and it's, it's, again, terribly depressing to see that kind of in a, in a minister of state, you know, my lord. Um, anyway, so those are the three areas. I mean, I'm sure there are others, but I mean, those seem to me to be the three areas that need attention, the obstacles to, um, to the better world where... Muslims and non-Muslims can live better together um, that need, need addressing. Um, I'd like to say, I mean, just because of where we are at the moment politically and, you know, where the world is and where Britain is, you know, probably all sort of heave a sigh of despair, but a word about Brexit, actually. I'm going um, to plunge in. I saw that the Minister of Wales has, has, has resigned today, and not the first, I don't think. Um, and I, I do think that Brexit is a sort of a tragedy, um, for Islam, for Britain, um, certainly for me personally. I and mean, I, I put my credentials on the table and I, you know, I, I've been working in and around EU institutions all my life. You know, I, I, was, a, I, was, a, I was a student intern uh, in the European Commission back in the 1990s. My father was a European politician at one point. I worked for the European newspaper. Um, you know, I worked in Bosnia um, as a peacekeeper, which had a lot of big sort of European, EU kind of... Uh, um, component to it. So in all my life, really, I've been kind of, you know, it, it feels like if it, if it goes through, and I'm not entirely sure it's still going to, but if Brexit happens, it's kind of a, an awful kind of thing. And I do, you know, believe that, that the, the Scottish um, unionist line at the time of the Scottish referendum campaign of better together, I think that's true. Um, why Britain is going off on its own at a time when the whole world is, you know, coalescing into great blocks. It seems to be going completely the wrong direction for the rest of the world. Um, it's sort of relevant because, um, you know, I remember the, 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 the vote to leave, which was while I was doing this book, um, 2016, the summer there. Um, I think I was in Woking somewhere. I, it was middle of Ramadan anyway. And, uh, um, and so that was very much part of the conversation that I was having with, with Muslims around the country. Um, I was rather amazed by it because I found um, in Birmingham, actually, I was at Green, the Green Lane Mosque, huge mosque um, in Small Heath um, for the Iftar dinner there and was talking to the, to the mosque manager. There were thousands of people there and talking about this stuff. And he said, um, you know, he was amazed, but he thought that the vote for the people going to his mosque was about 50-50. It was split. Um, he couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. We just had this Nigel Farage campaign of, you know, posters of kind of go back home, kind of stuff, posters that people were comparing to Nazi propaganda from the 30s. It was so clearly xenophobic, um, uh, anti-Islam, all the Sharia sway stuff, and yet half 
of the Muslims in, in that mosque, he reckoned, um, had voted to, to, um, for Brexit. And the reason was, he said, was that, you know, he'd had this conversation, was that, so well, we love it in this country. Um, um, we've got the best benefit system in the, in the world, um, but the lifeboat is full. We can't have any more people here. So we voted Brexit to stop anyone else coming in. So, I mean, very depressing um, for a pro-European like myself, but actually, on reflection, I thought about this. And, you know, that is an amazingly British um, response. I mean, that is just like, just like everybody else, you know. Because, um, I mean, it may be very selfish, but it's an indicator of how British they feel, you know. And, I mean, um, and of course, they're entitled to vote that way, and why should they vote differently, you know, in, in a way? I mean, you know, the country's half and half, they are British, and the vote was half and half, funnily enough, you know. Um, but I think it is a mistake, um, not just for the country, but for Muslims too, because, you know, I mean, you know, while this ridiculous debate has been going on for two or three years, you know, this has been Britain having a, you know, argument with itself, you know, furiously fighting with itself, ignoring what's going on in the rest of the world, including the rest of Europe, actually, which is still going to be next door, you know, whether we leave or not, you know. Uh, and they seem not to notice what's happening in Europe. You know, we're just coming up to another European election in June, and there is a battle royal going on for the soul of Europe. Um, and that is a battle between conservative, populist nationalists, people like, you know, Viktor Orban in Hungary, like Salvini in Italy, you know, against the liberal internationalists like, you know, Merkel and Macron, you know. And this country, Britain, has sidelined itself from that debate you know what a tragic what a terrible what terrible timing um, and what, a, what, a, what an awful thing to do and the whole brexit thing has been cast in terms of economic advantage it's all about you know we're getting out because they've been ripping us off you know in my mind to my in my view completely missing the point in a much much bigger question about question about you know european destiny our place in it it's far bigger than, far bigger than economy and trade it's about you know um you know, where we are in the world, what kind of country we want to be. Uh, and instead of being, you know, helping to shape um, the destiny of that continent, which we are a part, um, we're going down this route of a sort of a Britain first, you know, America first, Britain first type isolation. Um, you know, again, at a time when the rest of the world is coalescing to great blocks. And it seems to be um, a great pity. And... And the third point on that Brexit, just I'll, I'll, I'll finish on this in a second, but, um, you know, that the EU has, since World War II, has had a, you know, a political culture based on rights. Um, and from that, you know, you get this kind of moral oversight, um, a kind of moral direction about what is, you know, we don't always agree, European countries, but, you know, there is a sort of a consensus about what is the right thing to do especially in foreign policy. Um, and this is where it's going to affect British Muslims, all Muslims, I think, because I don't feel very encouraged about the direction that British foreign policy is going. Um, you know, there's a lot of evidence that we've kind of rather lost our moral compass on this. So think, you know, particularly of, you know, the way that we're still arming Saudi um, for, you know, for the use in Yemen at a time when even, you know, even in the US they're having second thoughts about that, you know, not us, you know, you know plowing on oh, the old way to support the Saudis, you know. Um, you know, I, I, I was bothered by the lack of compassion, the lack of consideration or debate really over the way that um, Shamima Begum was treated and, you know, her baby. That didn't strike me as being, you know, the actions of a country that I recognise and am proud of. It seems to me very poor, really. And, you know, and think of Sajid Javid and the way that he, just the other day, he's, I mean, this is getting a bit too political, perhaps, but he, you know, his very surprising reversal of 10 years of policy and he's prescribed Hezbollah. Um, you know, why? Um, you know, that includes, this is, the, this is the civil wing of Hezbollah, which is the, you know, military, okay. But the civil wing, this includes you know, elected Lebanese politicians who are now, you know, persona non grata after 10 years, you know, I mean, that doesn't seem to me to be a very considered piece of foreign policy at all. And you, you know, uh, you know, Muslims will wonder, rightly, I think, you know, what is, is there another agenda here? And if so, what could it be? And could it be Britain trying to position itself 
uh, cozying up to America in the new direction that we're going because America doesn't like Hezbollah and it's part of the whole Israel complex and, you know, maybe the Krishna Grand Plan, God knows. You know, you can see kind of Britain sort of edging away from Europe towards America and it's not, it's not a foreign policy direction that I think is going to be much good for us. I think it's a, I think it's a pity. Anyway, those are my, my last rather depressing um, remarks on Brexit. And um, um, who knows what's going to happen next. I, I think I might, I think I'll probably stop, actually. That's probably enough. I'd like, I hope that some of that has um, sparked a few thoughts and questions, because I'd love to kind of hear what you think, really, actually, all of you. And I could, I was thinking I could possibly do a short reading, but I think actually I'd rather throw it to the floor. And we're running a bit late anyway, so... So what do you think? Please, yeah, go ahead. Oh,